Again, thank you all for coming out. Uh, I want to introduce a personal friend of mine and colleague for many years, uh, Hannah Daring, who is Principal User Experience Designer at Wikiva. And she's going to be talking about vision types. And with that, Hannah. Thank you. So I want to start this evening with a bit of a story, a hypothetical, where you can picture yourself as a interaction designer at a company that builds a cloud application for UX designers. You and your PM have um, found this opportunity where you've noticed that there's a lot of pain around how many tools UX designers have to juggle every single day. And you think that your company could be the one to build the tool that goes over the entire process, from mock-ups to prototyping, um, ideation, the works. You explain this at a meeting with your stakeholders and kind of freak them out. The uh, the Developers go, whoa, 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 hold on a second. That would be a huge effort that um, would require skills that we don't have, would require deployment processes that we don't have. I, he can't handle it. Um, the business stakeholders are a little bit warmer to it, but they're just not sure about what kinds of pricing models we would use. That's completely new territory. And um, maybe it would actually offend some of our partners because we've, uh, they would turn into competitors then. And so the, the idea doesn't really seem to be gaining much traction, even though you and your PM think it's worth the time and investment and really could make your company rise to, to something at a higher level. Um, so at, at this point, how many of you guys would be excited about continuing on this project? One person. <laughs> so let's imagine that that meeting started a little bit differently. Okay, so now how many of you would be excited to build something like this? Okay, a few more. <laughs> All right. Let's see. So I, I swear this um, talk was not sponsored by Envision. <laughs> But we're often faced with challenges to um, kind of persuade the people around us to get on board with um, our ideas. So um, talking a little bit about change, this book is all about kind of the psychology around uh, facilitating change. And in it, the Heath brothers explain a model of the mind that includes two distinct parts. The first is the writer, which is our logical kind of um, analytical and rational side that um, thinks that it's in charge, but it's very easily tired and leaves a lot of the work to the elephant. The elephant is our more in emotional and in instinctual part that carries the brunt of the work, but really doesn't like to change from the status quo. So in our example story, the engineer and the business stakeholders had elephants that really didn't want to budge, and their riders came up with a lot of ex pretty good excuses of why they shouldn't change course. So when we talk about change, a lot of times people think that what happens is people analyze all of the options, they sit down and think about the pros and cons and the, the benefits of, of all of the options, and then pick one that, that they're going to change course. 
But this is a very writer-centric model and isn't really reflected in um, social psychology. So instead, what tends to happen more often is people see a problem or solution firsthand, they feel something, and then they are motivated to change. And so this is where vision types become very powerful tools for designers. I first read about vision typing on Marty Kagan's blog post, Vision Typing in the Hands-On Executive. At Workiva, we've also gotten the opportunity to um, sit down a few times a year with the whole UX team, brainstorm ideas that have come up throughout the years where we think there's opportunities that the company is missing, and vision type um, around these opportunities to try to make them more concrete. So what is a vision type? I want to expand beyond Marty Kagan's definition, which was basically equivalent with a high fidelity prototype, and define it as a prototype that is meant to show a persuasive story of a possible future. This is very different than prototyping for usability testing. It's meant to have some razzle-dazzle excitement that gets people excited and motivated and seeing the potential of this vision. So the reason that I want to expand it beyond just high fidelity prototyping is that I think that there can be a lot of power in even just low fidelity prototyping. So in this example, it doesn't have the exciting music and I'm going to speed it up. But this is an example of a, a video game um, that I believe was uh, made for a class. And in it we have um, our hero protagonist, that you're following around. We have a leveling up system that has the super high fidelity uh, pencil method of <laughs> demonstrating change. Um, and in it, he faces objectives that he must complete. Um, in this one, he has to find a baby for a mom who I guess misplaced it. <laughs> uh, and But you really start to get a feel for what this game could be like, how, what the controls are, what are the main pieces of work that the team is going to need to build in order to make this game a reality. Um, it even has a fun nighttime monster mode where you can basically just hack and slash kind of cute werewolves, I guess. Um, all right. So when should you think about maybe building a vision type? It's best when you have a known problem that hopefully you've discovered through user research and a lot of empath built up empathy with your users. Um, you should be able to really clearly frame for your team and stakeholders why it matters that this vision comes to pass. Otherwise, it's really not worth the effort of, of, of building this vision type. It's best used when there's an ambiguous or competing visions um, especially if the team is kind of has their all their own ideas of what you're building. Um, you can build multiple versions of a vision type that help get everyone thinking about the same picture. Um, so obviously this, this is something that you do early on in the before kicking off d detailed designer development. Um, it's also used as a way of persuading stakeholders that you should get resources around um, a particular thing. A caveat that this is not necessarily for every single project, um, but it doesn't just have to be for huge uh, new products. You can focus on smaller improvements um, or a specific feature in the app. So tonight I want you to think through a um, something that maybe in your world might benefit from a vision type. And so you each should have a worksheet, and if not, there are some more in the back. And I want you to take a minute to write a very short description of an idea idea that might benefit from a vision type. And I'm going to be walking through an example that we've had at Workiva a few years ago where our application is designed to help users collaborate with their teams on large documents. And we noticed that they were doing a lot of management of process outside the app, and we wanted to bring that in and thought that that could be a really powerful tool. So the idea that I'll be walking through is this idea of adding tasks to our application. So if you want to take a minute and write down whatever your idea might be. So now that you have your idea, you'll want to create, craft a story around it. Um, simply stepping through every single interaction in your idea is not really going to inspire anyone's elephant, elephant to budge. However, stories really resonate deeply with people and make ideas easier to remember and share. So in most stories, we have a protagonist that is faced with some sort of challenge. Um, and our hero needs to use your solution or your idea 
to um, get to hopefully a very positive outcome, um, fighting through whatever their challenge might, might throw in their way. And so I want to give you an example of a, a vision type that I did not do this very well in and was not very successful. Um, I was on the team at Workiva that was responsible for the admin site as well as a handful of other things. And so admin never got a lot of love because there were always bigger fires to fight that impacted way more users. Um, but we thought it was a pretty bit, or me and my PM thought it was a pretty important thing because the admins were the ones that were the gatekeepers of the users. So if the admin isn't happy, more people aren't going to enter the app. So we thought we wanted to illustrate how it could be better, um, the, the, the admin experience could be better. And so I came up with a series of screens that showed how we could um, make the settings, which were scattered across a myriad of pages, a lot more consumable, um, that users could also be able to then just search across them, and we could highlight the ones that they were looking for, um, easier navigation and presentation of having a large user set, and also um, being able to manage their content a lot more easily. Um, however, I actually added all of this animation last night. It was just a series of static screenshots that I emailed to a few people, and it didn't go anywhere because there wasn't an, an impactful story around what was this, who is this person, what was the pain that they were feeling, how was this going to help them do a lot better at their job and eventually make the company hopefully money. So in your case, what is your story? So. For the tasking story, um, we had two protagonists, the task assigner and the task assignee. And essentially, Paula, the assigner, wants to get Carl to do something, and he's not doing it. And she needs to follow up with him. And WDesk makes that a whole lot easier, and everyone is happy at the end. So if you want to take a minute and write on your for your idea, kind of what are the main beats of the story, keeping it at a, a pretty high level arc, kind of the who, the what, and how how they're made happy. All right, I'm going to keep moving, but if you want to come back and fill in the rest of your story, you're welcome to do late, so later. So some of the most effective vision types I've seen illustrate a solution that knits together the discordant pieces of maybe a work in progress or existing parts of your application. It's really easy for teams to work a feature by feature and lose track of the bigger story and all the cracks that a user is going to fall through in their um, actual experience. So your vision type can show how all those pieces work together and any additional pieces that might be needed to fill in those cracks. And so sometimes it's helpful to, in addition to the prototype, have some sort of diagram really illustrating how um, all of those pieces relate to one another. They could be screens or more abstract illustrations of the concept. Vision, sh vision types should also attempt to paint the picture at a very high level and not get too lost in the details. This is both for a practical reason of you don't want to spend too much time on it, so you're not going to be digging into every single detail, um, but also just to keep your story at a very um, digestible level. So John Kolko gave a really awesome talk at Interaction 17 about driving design vision, and in it he says that really you should, for, des for driving design vision, you should be setting just enough design to set a trajectory, not something that's going to really handcuff whatever designer is going to have to actually implement that down the road. It's also an area where super high fidelity prototypes can be pro problematic because they force you to present details as if they're finished, even though you might need a lot more exploration and uh, they around pretty much every single facet. One approach that I found to deal with this, um, this issue of high fidelity prototypes and get some of the benefit of an kind of excitement around sparkly, um, excited, finished looking UI while communicating that this is still a, a vision and an ambiguous one at that, um, is something we call kind of cute UI, which is uh, kind of a middle ground. So this was inspired by some illustrations my friend Rachel McClung did for some onboarding UI. 
And it simplifies the application, in this case Facebook, to just the recognizable parts, and then focuses in on the details of whatever part has a piece to play in your story. So in this case, um, the chat client on the right. Um, and so then using this as the model that you build your prototype and the interaction will all pretty much probably stay focused on the right. So coming back to your idea, what are the big chunks or pieces that make up your vision? In our case, the task creator and the task list were already being built at the time that this um, kind of came about. And we realized that we hadn't really thought about the whole story. Um, and so there were some big pieces that we wanted to illustrate and how that they would smooth things out. So the next thing that a good vision type should do is really push the boundaries of what's possible. In the books, in the book, uh, Shape, The Shape of Design, Frank Camaro says, the creative process starts with a great leap of lightness. Um, so in our day-to-day -day work, it's really easy to get bogged down in all of the constraints that we're dealing with, be they technical feasibility constraints, business requirements, style guides, company politics, all of that. Um, but sometimes those constraints are not as solid as they first appear, and the only way to really determine that is to push up against them. And so some of the biggest leaps of innovation actually comes from kind of pushing past those, um, those seeming constraints. So the next um, box is to just define one, at least one constraint that you should try pushing past to make the vision better. So in our case, it was um, there were a lot of technical pieces that were missing, um, frameworks that would be really make it a lot easier to build this, but weren't there. Um, and also the kind of the sales strategy around those that assignee user was really not well defined. So this is the point that you build your vision type using whatever tools and techniques you have for building prototypes. Um, in our example, we decided to use Keynote um, with some really rough sketches to try to illustrate the roughness of this um, story yet. And so I'll kind of walk through this. There were some animations, but they don't import into Google Slides, so you'll get the non-animated version. But um, So we had our two characters. Paula is the one assigning, and Carl is the one contributing. Paula has set up her document and wants to try out tasks. She um, basically goes in, picks what they, she wants the what she wants Carl to do, assigns it to him, and tells um, tells him when it's due. Once she's done with that, she can go through the rest of her document and assign it out to whatever own, whoever owns each part of the, that document. Meanwhile, Carl gets an email that tells him that he has a new task and allows him to jump into the document, into the place where, uh, where Paula said that she wanted him to, to review. He can indicate that he's started his review. And she gets that notification in her dashboard and sees, OK, this is, this is what work is in progress. The next time Carl goes into WDesk, he can start off where he left off by, um, instead of having to browse for the file, just be able to quickly navigate through his open tasks. And a few days later, Paula is sad because she notices that um, Carl has still not finished the review that she sent him. So she sends him a reminder. He gets the reminder, goes, oh yeah, there was a few things that I needed to, to set up. Um, and then once he's done, he can uh, check that one off in the task center and proceed to the next task that's available to him. She gets an email that it's done, so she's got peace of mind there. And she can also see it in her dashboard with all of the other um, tasks that, are going, that she's juggling. And so they're all very happy. <laughs> um, so once you have that prototype, you can bring it to users and start to validate if this is an idea even worth pursuing. Uh, Jeff Patton called this in, in kind of a differentiation from usability testing, which is testing whether each uh, interaction works. This one is just trying to get in the ballpark. It's like, are we even in the right field? Um, not whether where the ball is headed, but just are we in the right field? So this is, in, in the other way that this is different than usability testing, you probably shouldn't actually give them control over your prototype because for the sake of time, you probably limited it to a pretty thin slice and a pretty happy path to tell your story. You also want to avoid selling your um, idea too much at this point and instead listen very carefully to what they're reacting to and how they're reacting to it. Um, so what are they fixating on and what do they just gloss over and don't even pay attention to? 
Um, if they say that they like something and think that that could be kind of cool, um, trying to get them to tell specific stories of how this solution would have helped them in their day-to-day -day work. So in our example, one of the things that users fixated on kind of a surprising amount for us was this jump to dock. Um, the idea of having a notification that users could quickly get exactly to where they needed to look um, was again and again something that customers thought was very valuable and was super technically easy for us to do. Um, the big dashboard, they didn't care as much about, um, and we didn't end up building that right away. So that's another way where this helps out, kind of helps the PM prioritize um, what are the features that users are going to find the most valuable and not. So once you're confident that this idea is worthy of further effort, which maybe it isn't, so maybe it dies there, <laughs> but if it is, um, it's now time to evangelize, evangelize, evangelize. Um, we got an awesome talk by Leah Hickman, who is a product manager at Adobe um, at Workiva's development conference, and she was um, one of the instrumental players in getting the Adobe Creative Cloud off the ground. Um, so if most of you probably remember Adobe used to come in a box and released once a year and everybody had to go out and buy the latest version to get all the new features. And um, people at Adobe noticed that most software products were doing things a little bit differently. There were up and coming competitors that were being able to release new features and exciting things to, to their customers very rapidly and they wanted to make sure that they didn't get left behind. And so she um, had a prototype that was a vision type that was built. It basically showed the story of a freelancer and how they would experience um, the new Adobe Cloud platform from the point of mocking up various things in the software to posting it on her Behance site, um, the whole kind of story. And then she shared it around with all of her stakeholders using a method called the Nemawashi method. And so Nemawashi in Japanese literally means going around the roots. So it means going to each individual stakeholder individually, which yes, takes a lot of time, um, and meeting with them to get their buy-in before the big sign-off meeting. And what this does is it gives the opportunity to introduce the vision in a way that's meaningful to them. So what do they care about? If it's a business stakeholder, they're gonna care about very different things than your engineering stakeholders. And gauge their reaction and then address their concerns uh, and gather their input while reducing the interpersonal dynamics and politics that can often kill good ideas. So um, the Creative Cloud project actually re it required buy-in across products that could have been killed, like the teams were disbanded afterwards. Um, so talk about some tricky conversations. <laughs> So on your sheets, identify the key people that you need to share your vision type with. So what are, who are the, the people that are gonna be involved, the teams or individuals? Um, are there other people in your company that have tried something similar? Are there, who are gonna be your allies or your challengers? Um, and especially, who are gonna be the influencers, the people that if you convince them, they're gonna convince others for you? Um, so in our situation, the tasking team were the ones that were going to build it. The attachment team were a team that were going to build something on top of it later and wanted to um, have a, a say in how that framework uh, worked. And then the engineering management, when we showed this to them and showed them the feedback from the users, um, they actually gave us more resources so that we could build out the whole story rather than just the little pieces that we had um, prioritized at that point. So, so go ahead and take a minute to just jot down a few people that you would want to share it with. All right, finally, you should be very thoughtful about the artifacts that you're building. A really good vision type will enable others to promote the vision while you're not in the room. So you may need more than one version of your vision type. It may be one that you can walk through without a lot of words um, and another that people can page through um, by just sending them an email. So the version that I showed you was actually the self-sufficient one um, that had all the words and, and didn't have the animations in a PDF. The, um, it also, sadly, might take a while for your idea to gain traction. Um, I found that good ideas need a lot more than just being good ideas in order to become realities. They often need the right time, the right context, the right community to flourish. And so 
there have been several projects that I've worked on that there were exciting visions where we shared around, did not get a lot of traction, and then a year or two later, circumstances changed. Um, customers started saying things more to their salespeople, and then suddenly it was the new hotness, and everybody wanted to know more about this idea. And at that point, you don't want to be stuck going, uh, that was two years ago. <laughs> I don't remember exactly what, what went into that. And unfortunately, prototypes can often be very fragile. The technology changes um, and you're left with something that looks like this. Because I wanted to show you guys the animated version and I went into Keynote and all of the images were apparently missing because I uploaded it to Google Drive and back again. So good thing I had a PDF. So PDFs and movies are generally much clearer when you return to the project after a long time. So take a second to write down um, some artifacts that you'll make sure to save. So we had a keynote pr prototype that was low fidelity um, and had some animation with it, and then a PDF prototype we could email out that had words so that people could walk through it themselves. So my last point is probably the most important, and if you take nothing away from this talk besides this, this is probably the most important one and wasn't said by me. So um, this is a tweet from Peter Merholtz, and um, basically the, the essence of UX strategy is show, don't tell. Use design to make the strategy complete, concrete. That is what vision typing is all about, um, getting people excited by showing them what, what is possible. So that is all. So if we want, we can kind of finish up with questions or if you have um, stories about ways that you maybe used some stuff like this or opportunities that you see, we can kind of wrap it up. <laughs>